Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're located, and welcome to the Amtec Solid State Controls uh, webinar for this month, which is on DC ground faults. Um, just wait for everybody to uh, pile in, as they say. And uh, as always, I like to ask everyone if you can hear me. Um, so please type in the chat um, whether you can hear me or not. That would be uh, greatly appreciated, and whether I am loud enough, um, that would also be good. So I'll just wait for everybody and wait to hear that you can hear me, and then we will get started. Thank you very much. You hear me fine. That is always a plus. What's a webinar without you being able to hear me? <laughs> speaking to myself all day. Um, so just go over the basics uh, before we get started. My name is Craig Williams. I'm the Senior Technical Manager for Amatech Solid State Controls. Um, I work out of the Stafford, Texas office, which is just south of uh, the city of Houston. Um, we have I have 20 years in the industrial UPS industry. Goodness me, that makes me sound old. 20 years uh, working on industrial UPSs. And I have worked with all of the major UPS charger manufacturers out there. So um, uh, I'd like to say I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. Um, there will be a lag of around, I think it's about 30 seconds between you hearing my voice and me seeing a question. Basically, uh, Webinar Jam is the platform that we use, and they've got to process uh, this presentation, turn it into an iOS device um, stream, turn it into a Windows device stream, and turn it into an Android device stream, uh, because they're the three platforms that you can watch this on. So that takes a little bit of processing time. So when I speak, you're probably going to hear it about 15 to 30 seconds after I've actually spoken. So if you do type in a question, I'm not going to see it until 15 to 30 seconds after I have spoken. So because of that, what we try and do is we leave the Q&A, all the questions until the end. I promise I will get back to every question that's been asked. And on that note, you know, you can see on the right hand side there you have chat and uh, in the chat bar you have the chat option and the Q&A only option. If you have a question, it's much easier for us to track if you put it in the, the Q&A uh, tab in the chat bar. OK. Um, Webinar Jam has a panic button. Um, so basically what that means is if I see some comments that you can't hear me or the screen has frozen or something's going wrong and we confirm that it is something on my side, then I can hit the panic button and Webinar Jam will um, create a new room for all of us. Um, it will end this room and we will take over seamlessly into that other room as if nothing has happened, allegedly. Um, another very popular question is, will the webinar be recorded? Yes. Um, obviously, you're watching this, so you have registered for this webinar. You will receive a link after the webinar is complete where you can re-watch the webinar using the Webinar Jam platform. The problem with that recording is it's treated like a, a whole new webinar. Uh, you can't fast forward or rewind it. I think you can pause it, but you can't fast forward or rewind it. So because of that, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, because of that, what our fantastic mar marketing team do, and <clears throat> excuse me, London has just put it in the chat bar there. We will upload the video tomorrow to our YouTube channel. There's a, all of the webinars that we've done previously are on our YouTube channel. You can go and view them, down, um, share them, do whatever you want to do with them. Uh, it's, it's a completely open forum, um, so you can find them there. And the YouTube videos, you can pause, rewind, fast forward to find the bits that you're interested in. Or put me on 10 times speed. You know, I know what people do sometimes. Hopefully I won't bore you that much. Um, and the webinar should last around one hour. Um, I do have a habit of talking too much. I try not to, but you know, I really enjoy speaking about these technical things. So um, I'll try not to go on too far past the hour. And also it depends on how many questions we get asked at the end. 
Okay. So it looks like everybody is here. So let us get started. So the objectives today, we're going to be learning about the DC system basics. We're going to go over a basic charger, um, a, a DC system with a battery connected. Um, we're going to discuss what is a DC ground fault. Um, we're going to discuss how we, as in Amatex or state controls, or most charger manufacturers uh, detect ground faults. Um, then we can discuss how do you find the faulty circuit. And then the last part we're going to discuss is some misconceptions around ground faults. So hopefully uh, we'll get all of this explained and clear for you. So here is the most basic version of uh, a DC system. And this is actually my preferred uh, way for people to connect uh, systems when they're out in the field. So obviously on the left hand side here you have your MCC that's going to supply AC to your rectifier or your charger. Um, then that rectifier converts the AC, the AC here into DC and then that goes out to a DC panel and that DC panel has our load circuits connected here and then down at the bottom we also have a circuit for our battery. Uh, this is just a really good design of system because you can separate the battery from the system. You can separate the charger from the system. And in truth, you could add an additional charger in here if you needed to uh, replace this charger and use it as a temporary. So it's very flexible, uh, this DC system. I do like this design. OK, so this that's the very basics of a DC system and your loads are going to be basically switch gear systems. Um, it could be DC lube or pumps if it's a station battery in a power station. There's a whole load of uh, DC loads that um, can be supplied. OK. But the important thing um, about an industrial battery charger is it should always have an isolation transformer on the input okay and this isolation transformer gives you galvanic isolation between um, the ac that's coming from your mcc or your motor control center uh, or your switch gear room and the ac on this side that goes into the rectifier and i'll explain in the next slide why it is very important. That isolation basically allows the DC that's created by the charger to be called what what most people refer to as a floating DC voltage and we'll get into that term in a moment but what I want to do is go through why um, what an isolation transformer does, how it does it and um, why it does it. So you can see on the left hand side here the neutral is usually always connected to ground, and that's from the supply side. So from your MCC or from your switch gear room, OK, the neutral will usually be connected um, to ground. Now, obviously, if you're coming from a delta transformer, um, that's maybe not the case, but this is just for um, illustration purposes. But what you will notice here is, you know, we have complete isolation here. The primary windings here do not physically touch the secondary windings here. The power is transferred using um, electromagnetic force and induction. You know, the, the core of the transformer, it's magnetics. If you have a current flowing through the primary, that will induce a current flowing through the secondary, but there is actually no electrical connection between the two. So as you can see on the right hand side, on the secondary side here, there is no connection to ground whatsoever on this very simple drawing. OK, so we have a connection to ground on the primary, but we have no connection to ground on the secondary. OK. So for ease, uh, because we're in America, um, I know there are other people from uh, the Middle East and Europe uh, on this webinar, but we're going to stick with 120 volts 
as the AC input. OK, the neutral will be grounded at the source. OK. So if I measure between hot and neutral, I'll get 120 volts. And if I measure between hot and ground, I'll get 120 volts on the primary. But if I create a secondary here and it's just a one to one ratio, I'm going to have between hot and neutral. Yes, I'm going to have 120 volts AC and it's classed as a separately derived source. There is no connection to ground. This is as if we're creating a new source of power altogether. And that's why it's called a separately derived source. And hopefully the next few slides will help you explain that a little bit more. OK. So if you on the previous slide, I said if you go from the hot on the primary to the neutral or the hot to the ground on the primary, you will get 120 volts. But if you go from the hot to ground on the secondary, there should be no voltage, OK? Uh, there, there's no reference to that ground circuit. Um, and what confuses a lot of people is because of stray capacitance in cables that are getting run all over the plant, um, also some uh, uh, induction that happens between cables, um, there can be a weird voltage on a truly floating system. Um, you know, you could measure maybe it would start off at 25 volts, but then you would see it gradually reduce. And basically what's happening there is the uh, your fluke or your multimeter is acting as a load on that stray capacitance and it basically is discharging it and it will tend to go down to zero but in truth there is no reference it's as if the secondary of this transformer has no idea where ground is it is just floating in the ether and has no idea whatsoever where ground is it doesn't care where ground is on this simple transformer okay it does not care whatsoever it doesn't need ground to operate all it needs is a hot and a neutral or a live and a neutral and as an example for this you can connect a lamp between the directly between the hot and any part of the ground circuit on the primary and you can attach a light bulb or a lamp and that lamp will light. I'm not connecting it between hot and neutral. I'm connecting it between hot and ground. That lamp will light because neutral is the same point as ground. OK. But if I connect a lamp between the hot and ground here, the lamp will not light. There is no return path for that current. The, the lamp has uh, the sorry the secondary of this transformer has no idea where ground is so there's no path for the current to come back the lamp will not light and i say it in my training class when i'm training new ups technicians here at the stafford office if you wanted to i don't recommend anybody ever do this but as um an example somebody could put their hand on this ground or earth bar here and then put their other hand on this hot connection here obviously you have to measure to make sure there's no potential and you will not get an electric shock there is no path for the current to flow all you're doing is at that point is making hot the same reference point as ground using the resistance of your body you will the no current will flow you will not get shocked i promise you but do not try it. Uh, just take my word for it. The lamp bulb is you. OK, so if you're going to do it, do it with a lamp bulb and not with your hands. But I just use hands as an example because I'm that confident that uh, that is the case. OK, so the. Oh. So this is the exact picture that I just showed you here on the left hand side. There is a transformer. OK, we are floating. Um, and now all we're doing on this picture here is we have added a charger. Or a rectifier uh, onto that separately derived secondary transformer. OK, 
remember there is no connection to ground and then also what we've done is we've connected a battery on the output of that charger in parallel with the charger and then obviously the battery usually sits on a rack and that rack is metallic it will usually be covered with uh, some form of a plastic coating but it is metallic so that battery rack has to be grounded so the battery rack will be connected to ground and that usually will be the same ground um, in the plant that the primary the transformer is connected to but still what I'm trying to uh, say here is we still have absolutely no reference to ground on the output here whatsoever at this time. Okay. Hopefully you are following me. I know there's going to be a lot of people at this point. They're saying, ah, oh, but you, there is a voltage on the output of my charger. There is a voltage on my battery between positive and ground or negative and ground. We will get to that, I promise. OK, uh, but just believe me as I go through this and you'll uh, start to understand why uh, there is going to be a potential there later. OK, so if I took a fluke, uh, a fluke meter, any type of multimeter in this circuit that's on the screen here, and I went between the positive of the battery and the battery rack ground once again, there should be no voltage. There is no reference, so there should be no voltage. But once again, there can be stray capac capacitance and other things giving a ghost potential. But you will see that decay on your meter. Um, and that's important because when we get a few slides on, you will see that there can be circumstances, if it is a 135 volt system, that you could get 25 volts measured. But if it is a fixed 25 volts, then we have an issue. If it is at 25 volts, it tends towards zero, then you know that your system is still completely floating free of the ground connection. OK. And the same is for the negative. If we measure between negative and ground, there would be it should be zero. There is no reference, so there should be no voltage. So that's the basics of um, let me just go back here. That is the basics of a floating system. And hopefully you, you kind of understand and grasp that concept. Another way that I like to look at it is if I draw a nine volt battery like this, OK? That is positive and that is negative, nine volts. When you put a nine volt battery in any piece of equipment, it's not connected to ground. That nine volt battery has no idea where ground is whatsoever. So that's similar to what we're saying here. You know, this is still a, this is a big battery and it's probably going to be a 60 cell 135 volt battery. But when it's designed like this, it just it has no idea where ground is whatsoever unless you introduce ground to the circuit in some way. And we're going to get to that in in a moment. OK. And before I do move on, one more reason for why we do this is remember. Battery maintenance is an important part of plant maintenance, so there are going to be people who go out on a quarterly, six monthly annual basis and touch your battery and maintain your battery. OK, so if they're exposing themselves to the terminals on the battery and obviously especially if it's a big battery they're leaning up against the rack and they're reaching over the rack you want to make sure that the rack and the battery are completely separated so they can't get an electric shock you know if the if the battery did have some form of connection to ground and uh, let's say this negative was actually physically connected to ground and they leaned on that battery rack and uh, let's say with their left hand they've got their left hand on the battery rack and there was some exposed metal and then they used their right hand to clean off um, a positive terminal on the battery uh, without gloves on obviously they should never do that then you they will be exposed to a shock in that circumstance and we don't want that we want our uh, people working on the battery to be as safe as we possibly can. So that isolation transformer gives us that safety. 
So what are the most common causes of ground faults on DC systems? And actually, I should have made this clear before I started. We're not talking about AC ground faults. That's a different subject altogether. Maybe I'll do a webinar on it, but I'm not as familiar with AC ground faults as I am with DC ground faults. So the usual suspects for DC ground faults include worn, isolate, worn insulation, conductive dust, water, or other soft grounds. Okay, so insulation breakdown is when the insulation on the outer sheathing of a cable breaks down and the inside conductor is exposed to uh, touching ground, basically. And I love this picture because <laughs> looking at it straight away, I've been in America for 10 years, but I can tell straight away that this is a UK cable. Blue is neutral, brown at the back there is hot, and this yellow and green one is earth ground. I don't know why that makes me smile, <laughs> but it does. Um, but that's, that's a good example of insulation breakdown. Something has rubbed or nicked or uh, broken that insulation down through into the cable conductor. OK. Conductive dust. Obviously, this is a very extreme example, and I'm, I'm guessing this is a sawmill um, of some sort. But you can see there is a whole pile of sawdust down there. And that's the most concerning ones here. You can see there is sawdust resting across the, these terminals here. And if I get some moisture in it and uh, becomes conductive, that is a direct short uh, between those two or three cables there. OK, so that's a good example of dust, although it's a very excessive uh, example of how dust can affect uh, a system. Water. Uh, this actually looks like this yellow stuff is resin. That is not resin. There's actually water inside this um, uh, junction box. OK, and obviously you, you have your two terminals here. If that water has impurities in it, then that will cause a short um, across those two. That will probably blow a fuse. But if if not, it may just cause uh, one of those cables to go down to ground somehow. OK, good example. And snakes. <laughs> Especially if you're in the Gulf Coast, you wouldn't believe the amount of pictures that I've seen of raccoons, snakes and all that kind of stuff in the Gulf Coast of uh, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. Uh, um, we get a lot of wildlife in our uh, MCCs. So I thought that was uh, uh, quite a funny picture to show everybody there. OK. So what is um, a ground fault? Let me just do this. What is a DC ground fault? Well, it's when one pole of the DC system somehow gets connected through a fault down to the ground of the the building okay that in its most common form that is what a dc ground fault is obviously it can happen on the positive side or it can happen on the negative side now if it's a hard ground in other words it's a very low resistance fault um and what i'm going to do is I usually always talk in terms of a 135 volt dc battery okay so let's say that the positive has shorted directly to ground and it's a very low resistance fault fault sorry when you take your multimeter and you measure between the positive pole of the battery and ground you are going to get zero volts because it's the same potential it's a direct short okay so there's no potential between the positive and ground because positive is connected to ground okay but for a hard ground fault, if you then measure between negative and ground, you're going to measure the full system voltage, 135 volts DC, because ground is now at positive potential. Actually, I should have put a, a minus symbol there. You're going to get minus 135 volts uh, DC. OK, but you're going to get the full potential across the system on a hard 
ground fault. We also get soft ground faults where there is some resistance in the fault. It's not a complete, hard, direct connection to ground. So if there's some resistance, let's say on the negative, um, we've got a, a some some resistance in this fault to ground here between the negative and the ground circuit. Maybe you'll measure 15 volts on your meter. Once again, it's probably going to be minus 15 volts. But what remember earlier I mentioned it should tend towards zero. In this circumstance, it's not going to. If the the resistance of that fault, if it sees that it's 15 volts, your meter is not going to make any difference to that. It's going to stay at 15 volts and 15 volts and remain at 15 volts. Okay. And then obviously when you measure between positive and ground on a soft ground that I just uh, gave an example of, you're going to get the other 120 volts there. Okay. And that's going to be steady. That is not going to tend towards zero either. Okay. It's going to remain constant. So that's the difference between a hard fault and a soft fault. And I can't tell you what the values are going to be for a soft ground fault. It, it, it could be, uh, it depends on the resistance of the fault itself. It, you know, it could be 50 volts on one pole and 70 volts on the other. The lowest pole is the one that has the fault. That's what you've got to remember. Okay. And Sonny, I do see your question, but I'm going to leave it until um, the end. It's a very good question, actually. OK. So how do we detect ground faults? And this is where a lot of you are going to, maybe going to have an aha moment, OK? Um, because a lot of you have been sitting here watching this presentation so far. I'm thinking, Craig, yeah, but my system has a balanced voltage between the positive and ground and negative and ground. And this is going to be why, because your charger has a ground fault detection circuit in it. And this circuit here that is on your screen is the most simplest form of ground detection that you can get. All you do is you put a lamp, sorry, two lamps connected in series uh, across in parallel with the charger, if that makes sense. OK, and then you connect the center point of those two lamps to ground. OK. Now, if it's a five watt lamp, then basically you can use Ohm's law and that works out that the uh, resistance of each lamp is 3K. And I'm going to take you all the way back to your college classes and the term potential divider or um, uh, some a divider circuit using uh, ratios, resistors and Ohm's law. I'm not going to hurt your brain. I'm going to make it really simple for you. OK, basically, two resistors in series of the same value create a potential divider circuit that has a ratio of 50 50. In other words, whatever, if as long as these two lamps or two resistors here are exactly the same resistance, then you are going to have a potential divider which will divide the voltage into at this midpoint here. So as you can see, if you measure between the positive point of the charger to ground, you are going to get 67.5 volts DC. And if you measure between the negative potential and ground, you are going to get 67.5 volts DC with a 135 volt DC battery. Obviously, 67.5 and 67.5 equals 135. If we lifted this terminal here, OK, this charger would go back to floating operation and it would have no reference to ground whatsoever, just like I've shown you before. It's only because we have added this ground fault detection circuit that we have now virtually tied the ground to the halfway point of the battery. OK. 
Now you can see in this picture here, well, maybe you can see, I don't know what the resolution is like. These lamps in normal operation are going to be dimly lit. There's not going to be a huge amount of current flowing through them because um, of the resistance of the lamp. Um, they're designed to be 120 volt lamps. So they're probably going to be half bright because they're only getting half the voltage. And that's how we know we've got a ground fault because on this next slide, let's say we have a hard positive ground fault. The, uh, the positive of the system is a direct short to ground. And remember what I said, if that happens, this point here, ground now becomes uh, the positive bus bar. So there is no voltage across this top lamp. So that top lamp will go off. It will not light. And because there's no voltage across there, all of the voltage is dropped across this second lamp. And that second lamp now has its full voltage that it's designed for, and it will light bright. And that indicates that we have a positive ground fault. A lot of people get confused when and say, well, that lamp is on the negative side. That's a negative ground fault. No, that's not how it works. Um, the design is if you have a positive ground fault, that one goes out. And then obviously all of the potential goes across this one here. And that is the positive ground fault light. And obviously the, the, the reverse is true. If we have a negative ground fault, so negative is now a hard fault to ground, then this lamp will go out and this lamp will have full potential across it. So it will be fully bright. And that indicates that we have a negative ground fault. So that is the most basic, basic form of ground fault detection. And that is why on nearly all industrial systems, you will find that the voltage between the positive to ground and negative to ground is halfway between the battery voltage. So for a 135 volt system, it's 67.5 for, uh, that's for 60 cells lead acid. For 120 cells lead acid, it's going to be 135 volts positive to ground, 135 volts negative to ground. Okay, it's just basically a ratio of half. And in truth, that was in the olden days, the lamps, very simple, cheap, circuit. What Amatec and most other charger manufacturers do is they now have a control board or this is actually on the charger control board. It's on maybe on an alarm board or um, in some of our systems, it's actually on our power, uh, power supply board. Um, but basically, we measure the, the potential positive to negative with respect to ground using this alarm circuit here. And there's op amps and discrete circuits. And basically we have set points that we put in and it will say, okay, this has gone within a certain threshold of going to uh, towards ground on one of the legs. I'm gonna send an alarm out. It's gonna light a lamp on the front of the charger and it will send an alarm to the common alarm circuit and uh, tell the control room at the plant that you have um, a ground fault, okay? Uh, obviously all of these circuits are proprietary, but remember, we do still have two resistors here. They are still gonna be probably three to five kilo ohms, depending on uh, the, the size of the battery. Um, and it's gonna create that potential divider circuit. We are still gonna have 67.5 and 67.5 because of these two resistors, okay? And there's one other way that, well, there's probably lots of other ways actually, but there's one other way that I know of um, to monitor ground fault circuits that is slightly different. It doesn't use a potential divider system. What it actually does is it injects, a, I think it, the bend is system, injects a voltage between the positive and ground and the negative and ground. And then it, it uses calculations to work out what the insulation resistance is between those points. So if you have a bender system or something similar to how a bender DC ground fault detection operates, you will not get 
the halfway uh, voltage uh, between positive and ground and negative and ground. The bender actually gives you some really weird readings between positive and ground and negative and ground. And it's a proprietary circuit that they use. I have no idea how it works, but just know if you have a bender system on your uh, DC system and it is your form of ground fault detection, then you are not going to measure the halfway point between positive and ground and negative and ground. Okay. So that's the major ground fault uh, circuits that are out there. I'm just going to take a drink. One moment. So we're going to go back to the typical DC system and how we find out actually where the ground fault is. You know, if, if your charger has a, a ground fault alarm on it, you want to know where it is, obviously, so you can clear it and go back to normal operation. So here we have our normal, typical DC system that we started off with uh, earlier on in the slide. And we've got a positive ground fault alarm on our charger rectifier here. Okay, it's saying we have a positive ground fault alarm. So the first question everybody is uh, going to say is, okay, we've got a ground fault. Where is it located? So the first thing to do, and this is the way that I would always recommend that you look for your ground faults. Now, obviously, I'm working in an ideal world where things can be disconnected and you can isolate load circuits or you can switch things off or if you switch the charger off, you still have, you can rely on the battery or if you switch the battery off, you can rely on the charger. So it's kind of an ideal world, but it's an ideal world so I can show you the, the steps necessary to find out exactly where the fault is, okay? So the first thing is, is it in the charger itself? That's what a lot of people think. Oh, the alarm's on the charger, so the fault must be in the charger. Uh, that couldn't be further from the truth, but we will um, look into that. So if you think that the fault is in the charger, or if you are just looking for a ground fault in, um, this is a step that you should be taking. First thing to do is to isolate the charger, okay? And to do that, the first thing I would do is open the output breaker on the charger. You still have your battery available if it's connected like this circuit here. So your load circuits will still remain powered, okay? But if you open this breaker here and disconnect all of this from the charger, then basically we can say, okay, if we open this breaker and the charger remained, I mean, the alarm remains on, the, the positive ground fault alarm stays on, we know that the fault is in the charger, okay? If we open this breaker here and the fault goes off, we now know it's not in the charger. It is somewhere either in the battery, the DC panel, or the load circuits. So we, in one step, we have confirmed one block is either yes, that's the culprit, or is not the culprit, okay? Now, I've circled this breaker here as well, because you've got to remember, breakdown of insulation can be a problem as well. So we have to check this cable between the charger and the DC panel as well to make sure the fault is not on that cable. So that's why I always suggest do that breaker first. And then what I would do is close that breaker. And then I would open this breaker. And that's testing this cable part here. If the fault remains on when you open this breaker here, then the fault is somewhere in this cable. If you open this breaker here and the fault disappears, we have now isolated the fault. It's either in the DC panel, it's in the battery, or it's in the load circuits. So we're getting somewhere, okay? So let's say we've opened both of these breakers and the fault ground fault alarm disappeared. That means we know it's either in the DC panel, the battery, or the load circuit. So let's continue. Let's 
go down to the next culprit that a lot of people point towards. They think that the fault is on the battery. Very rare that you're ever going to see a ground fault on a battery, but it can happen. You can have an electrolyte leaking from a very poorly maintained battery, and that electrolyte can track all the way down from the positive post down to the battery rack and find some metal through the plastic in that battery rack and cause a soft fault on the battery. It is possible. Very rare, though. But the easy way, once again, we've still got the ground fault alarm on. We just open this breaker here. OK, is it on the battery? If we disconnect the battery and the ground fault alarm goes away, then the fault is on the battery. You found it. OK, if you open the breaker and the ground fault alarm remains, it stays on. Now we know it's either in the DC panel or it's on the load circuits. So you have to do this methodically. It's like um, a criminal investigation. You've got to do it methodically. So you're working out, OK, I'll start here and let's move along the line until we find out where it is. OK, so we've ruled out it's not on the charger. It's not on the cable between the charger and the DC panel and it's not on the battery. OK, the next point we're going to look at is, is it in the DC panel? OK, now this is where it gets tough. Because it could theoretically be in the DC panel. So we've worked out it's not in the battery. We've worked out in, it's not in the cable. So the only way we can isolate it to say, OK, is it in the DC panel is to switch off all of your load circuits. OK, I do understand in most circumstances, you're not going to get permission to do that. You're going to need a plant outage to do that. Um, but it is the easiest way to do it. So basically, if there is only three circuits connected on this DC panel and you switch every one of those off, basically you are disconnecting anything from the outside world getting back into the DC panel. If the positive ground fault stays on, yay, you found it. The ground fault is actually in the DC panel somewhere and you would have to look for a, a pinched cable or uh, maybe a loose cable has come out and is touching ground. Um, it's usually a pinched cable um, or something has been rubbing toward, uh, on a sharp piece of metal in the DC panel. Um, but it's usually definitely a cable to ground uh, fault if it is in the DC panel. If you open all of these circuit breakers and the ground fault goes off, we now know that it's either in circuit one, circuit two, or circuit three. It's in the load circuits, okay? So we're really getting somewhere now. We've ruled out four places where it could be. So the last thing is, is it on the load circuits? Obviously, yes, we have to find out which load circuit it is. And once again, we're working in the ideal world um, and we can switch off these breakers one at a time. And that is what you have to do. So we switch off circuit one. If the fault goes away, then the fault is on circuit one. OK, if we open circuit one and the fault remains, that means it's on either circuit two or circuit three. So we move on. We move to circuit two. We open that breaker. If the fault stays, that means we know it's going to be on circuit three. If the fault goes away, then we know the fault is on circuit two. And just to check, I would always double check. I would then move on to circuit three. I would open that and then the fault would go away because that's what we've determined. It's on circuit three. Um, but just always double check what you've been doing. So a lot of people are going to say, OK, Craig, that, that's fantastic. I'm not going to send my electricians out into the field or as an electrician or a technician, I'm not going to go out into the field and open these circuit breakers. There must be another way to try and find these ground faults without switching the circuits off. And there actually is. Um, in the US, Mega 
uh, make a BGFT, a battery ground fault tracer. Uh, there are other manufacturers out there. I think Fluke have got in on this as well. And um, I used to use a great one in the UK, but I can't find it anymore. Um, and I can't remember the name of it. It was a very old uh, fault tracer and it came in a leather satchel. Uh, it was old school, but it was really, really good. Uh, but they all work on the same principle, and I'm going to explain how they work. So, once again, we've got the positive ground fault alarm. And if you've got the uh, mega battery ground fault tracer, what you do is you have two leads that you need to connect to the system. And it doesn't really matter where you connect it in the system when you're connecting the, uh, uh, the signal probes. Basically, we know it's a positive ground fault, so we have to connect the red lead to the positive, and we have to connect the black lead to ground, okay? Because what the uh, signal generator does, there's a signal generator inside the uh, BGFT, the battery ground fault tracer, and it creates a very low voltage, low current AC signal, and it injects that signal along the fault line that signal will only travel because it needs a return path will only travel from the positive down to the ground and it has to flow through so let's say it was in circuit three it would have to flow through all the way through circuit three and then get back down to ground that way okay that is what the uh ground fault tracer is doing it's injecting a low voltage, low current AC signal that's not going to, it shouldn't cause any spurious trips on any of your uh, circuits. You can do this test live, okay, without switching any of the breakers off. And then what you do, once you've connected the uh, positive and negative to ground on the signal generator part of the BGFT, then you have a receiver part of the BGFT as well. And it's got an amp clamp, basically it's a CT, that is tuned to listen for that specific frequency signal that's coming from the BGFT. So what you do is you get your CT um, and you put it on circuit one. Obviously, remember we're saying that the fault was on circuit three. So we put it on circuit one and your receiver is gonna tell you that there's no fault there. It won't pick up a signal, okay? So you, you put it on circuit one, no signal, everything's good. We then move that amp clamp down to circuit two. Once again, the receiver is gonna tell you there is no signal coming back from the signal generator. So the fault is not on circuit two. And then we move the CT or the amp clamp down to circuit three, and you're gonna see a reading on the um, the receiver at this point, and it will say, hey, look, I found the signal that we're looking for. It will tell you um, that the fault is on circuit three. And you can say, okay, now I've got to get the drawings out. I've got to find what does circuit three feed. And it's probably going to be an analyzer out in the field somewhere. And there may be um, water in the junction box of the analyzer, or there may be a junction box between this circuit three and the analyzer, and that's got some water in it. Um, and, and that's the important thing, uh, why it's a low current, low voltage signal that the BGFT is sending out is because if it's a very, very low moisture, uh, soft fault, it's not enough current to evaporate that water and make the fault disappear and then make it impossible to find. Um, so that's, how you find a ground fault using uh, a ground fault tracer. Pretty much all of them work exactly the same. Just some of them are digital output. Some of them are analog meters to see the signal. Um, uh, but they all basically inject an AC signal onto the DC system. And uh, you can find the fault using a CT. I make it sound very easy <laughs> using this equipment I've used uh, the system in the UK a lot, not this mega one, but the one that I used to work. It does take 
practice. You do have to tune it. You have to read the instructions of the equipment and you have to tune it before you start using it. But it's it's quite simple. It's in the instructions. It tells you how to, to tune it and set the, the amplitude of the voltage signal so you get the best signal on the receiver. Okay. Um, so that is how you found find cryon faults without having to switch off your load circuits. Uh, it's quite an expensive piece of equipment, but uh, you know if your plant does have quite a lot of uh, ground faults, it's probably worth the investment. Okay, and we have absolutely nothing to do with Mega. In truth, Mega is one of our competitors, so um, I shouldn't be telling you this. <laughs> okay. So uh, the last thing we'll do is we'll move on to some uh, misconceptions. Okay, the first one is the alarm is on the charger. So the fault is on the charger. Basically, uh, I've gone over that already. Um, that That's not the case. It's just because the alarm is on the charger or the alarm in your control room it may be connected saying that the alarm is coming from the charger. So everybody thinks the, alarm, the, the actual ground fault is in the charger. No, it's not. It's usually... I would say 95% of the time, maybe even 99% of the time, it is always the load circuits that are causing a ground fault. Okay. So it's not going to be in your charger most of the time, but it's very easy to, to, to find that out. Just open that breaker. And if the alarm goes away, that means the ground fault is out here. If the alarm stays with this breaker open, then you have just confirmed yes. It is in the charger. That is very, very rare. Okay. The next one is when I measure between ground and the battery, I get a weird, a weird uh, reading. What do I do? Um, remember, the important thing about that weird reading is, is it steady or is it tending to move towards zero volts? OK. If it's steady. And it's not the halfway point of the battery, then, yes, you probably have a soft ground fault. If it is a value on your multimeter that then starts decreasing down to zero, then it just means your system is completely floating and you actually don't have any ground fault det detection system on your charger um, and you have to find the ground fault yourself. The, the charger is not going to tell you that there is a ground fault. Very rare these days. Most chargers co come with uh, ground fault detection circuits in them. And the last one is I don't have to worry about ground faults. Everything works OK, even if I have a ground fault. Eh, there is some truth in that but i'll explain here why that maybe is not the case okay yes one ground fault in most circumstances is not going to cause you major issues although there are some exceptions and i don't have time to go into those exception exceptions today but this circuit here is basically a cut down version of a switchgear control circuit okay you've got your uh, coils down here you've got your contacts here and there's whatever your motor or whatever you're sending a signal to um, out there okay so basically we have our uh, battery connected to the switch gear system it says 130 volts dc there this is our ground fault detection circuit it's a schematic um example of it it's not it's just basically remember two resistors of identical value in series connected in parallel across the the the, the dc create a potential divider so yes you are going to get uh, basically 65 volts there and 65 volts there and the capacitors are just that adds um some stability to that potential divider um so that's what this circuit part is here OK, and this is what we're controlling. Um, so it's probably this is a tripping and closing supply for a big uh, MCC breaker. 
So let's say we do somewhere in the switchgear uh, equipment, we have a fault between the DC bus and ground. All that does is it makes ground now at the same potential as the DC bus. All of this equipment here, all it's looking for is 130 volts. It doesn't care about ground in most circumstances. It couldn't care less that you've got a positive ground fault on. It's going to carry on working uh, regardless. The main issue is if you then get a negative ground fault when you haven't cleared your positive ground fault. OK, if you get a negative ground fault and a positive ground fault at the same time, basically you are creating a direct short between the positive and the negative. And if you see here, we've got two fuses in this circuit and there is always going to be fuses um, to protect if there is a fault in any of the coils back here. OK, so. If you have a direct short, you have a positive and a negative ground fault at the same time, one of these fuses is going to blow. And if one of those fuses blows, your breaker is not going to work anymore. So if it's an energize uh, to trip, then you're not going to have um, the ability to trip that breaker anymore. And if it's a de-energize to trip, then basically as soon as you have both ground faults, it's going to de-energize and you are going to trip that breaker. OK. So, yes, one ground fault, that may not be the worst thing in the world, but two ground faults on the opposite pole, um, that is going to cause major issues in your plant. Wow. Any questions? We have got to the end of the presentation and I am four minutes uh, early. So uh, that's actually pretty darn good for me. Uh, we will now move on to the Q and A and the questions. So let's go down to the first one. Uh, Sunny, from my experience, how much percentage of charges don't have isolation transformers in industrial applications? I would say probably only less than 5%. Um, the design engineers should know this. Um, and it's very rare that they would um, install a system that doesn't have an isolation transformer. There are a lot of commercial style UPSs out there that um, don't have isolation transformers on them that are sold as industrial units. And the ones that's come to mind is Mitsubishi, some Toshiba systems, um, I think some Liebert systems as well. You've got to buy a separate um, isolation transformer. Those systems don't have isolation transformers and um, therefore there are there is some connection um, between ground. The AC, it, it's weird to go into on this presentation, but you will actually get to see some of the AC signal from your MCC on your battery. Maybe actually that's a, a thing I can go. Actually, I think I've got a presentation for that. It's commercial versus industrial, but it shouldn't be done. That that's if if you're going to install a charger um, on a switchgear system or a charger on an emergency shutdown system, uh, it should be a floating system that has an isolation transformer. So I would say less than five percent. Um, charges out there. Um, that's my general feeling. Uh, but we're all moving towards um, higher efficiency charges uh, that use power factor correction and IGBTs on the front end. Um, some manufacturers are trying to save money and space by skipping the isolation transformer as well. Um, I think we are introducing our own uh, high frequency charger within the next year. And I'm um, Pretty sure ours is still going to have the isolation transformer in it for this exact purpose. So thanks for the question, Sonny. That was a good question. Bill asks, for three-phase systems, what winding configuration would be used for an isolation transformer? Um, I don't know what your, uh, your supplies are, but basically for all of our charges, we want a... Uh, it's, I think it's usually a, it's a Delta star. So all we need to our charges is a Delta connection. Okay. Um, we don't even need a neutral run to our three-phase charges. Uh, and that should be the case. Um, 
for most charges. We're just using a delta uh, supply. We don't need the neutral run. There's no ground connection to worry about or anything like that. So um, for most industrial charges, it should be a delta supply fed to the, the charger. Inside our charger, we convert that to a star or a Y secondary, uh, but that's for our own internal purposes to do what we need to do with the SCRs. Thanks for that question, Chris. Hopefully that answers, sorry, Bill. Thanks. Hopefully that answers that. Uh, do you need to isolate the charge and divide a circuit used to detect the ground fault when using the ground fault detector? Um, it is best to, because it can give you some false readings. Um, but the, the, the resistors in there should be high enough in that potential divider that it shouldn't be an issue. But on the safe side, if there is a fuse or if there is a lead that you can lift to disconnect that ground fault detection circuit in the charger, to, when you're using something like the mega um, ground fault detection system, then yes, I would definitely recommend it because that potential divider will allow some of that low voltage, low current uh, signal to go back through the charger system, okay? Great question, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I'm not going to say what you said there, but actually I do do that. <laughs> uh, Jacqueline, uh, why do we ground the battery rack? It is for safety. Um, all, elect all metal objects within an electrical system have to be uh, bonded to ground. They have to be bonded. Uh, would the charger possibly have an isolation transformer in it? Yes. That, when I drew it externally, it's externally, for example, only all of industrial charges will have that charger, uh, that transformer inside of it. It will not be external. So I apologize that I didn't clarify that point. Near enough, always inside. OK, let's go into the Q&A and see what we've got in there. Um, what is the range of DC fault currents? Well, that's a very good question, Amir. Um, from what I can remember, and I should have read up on this a little bit more before I did this presentation, but I am a busy man sometimes. Um, I, some In my brain, 50 milliamps is what mo is the industry standard because they did some testing and they found that 50 milliamps of fault current is enough to trigger a relay that can cause a switchgear system to operate out with um the control circuit so either make a trip or make it um uh, break the supply so what we're looking for is anything less than than sorry anything up to 50 milliamps anything more than 50 milliamps is going to be uh could cause issues excuse me that's my phone going off i should not be doing that um, so, uh, ba, 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 where was I? Yeah. So that is the currents that we're, we're talking about. Um, so that's why all of the detection circuits are built to, to measure low amounts of current. Uh, the next one is with the charger possibly. Yeah. Sorry. That was Roberts. If dual charger configuration, uh, coupled together, can we use earth fault detection system? Yes, but that's a very, very good question. Uh, hopefully I get your name right, is it Edian? Um, if you put charges in parallel, what happens is you are putting that resistor network in parallel. And sorry to hurt your head with Ohm's law again, if you put two resistors of exactly the same value in parallel, then the resistance of the whole circuit becomes half of that value. So it actually does skew the, um, the sensing circuit and can cause faults to come in earlier than expected. It can give you nuisance faults. So you do have to address that um, at the design stage but it still it shouldn't be an issue if it's done properly. All you really have to do is get the manufacturer to change those resistor values because they know it's going to be in parallel. Um, the only issue with that is if they then become if you take one out of service um, for any reason, 
then the other system with the higher resistance values in that potential divider circuit are not going to alarm at the correct level. So it's a difficult balance when you put charges in parallel on how to set up the, the, the ground fault detection circuit. But it's something that you definitely have to think about. Great question, Edian. Really, really good question. Hopefully that answered it. Um, can I talk a little bit on split systems? 225 tied together to create 250 volts loads. Ooh, that's a good question, Robert. I haven't really seen many of, of those. Um, so I, I really can't talk to them. And I don't know how you would do that. Um, you would probably have to connect the ground fault detection circuit at the DC panel that supplies those two different voltages. So basically, if you have two battery systems connected in series to give you 250 volts, then I would put a 250 volt um, DC monitoring circuit somewhere at that DC panel. Uh, yes, Robert, I could have guessed. <laughs> this is an old nuclear plan. Um, so I would do it at the panel, probably not at the charger itself. So have a ground fault detection system at the 250 volt DC panel and then have a ground fault detection circuit at the 125 volt DC panel um, and have that go to your control room. Um, that, that should work. Um, I, I don't see why there would be any issues with that. Um, but great question. And I haven't had the privilege of going into a nuclear plant. Uh, I'm going to get my citizenship next year, I think. I can't get into most nuclear plants because I'm not an American citizen. So um, next year I'm planning on getting my citizenship. That's something I've been putting off. So I'll be able to get into a nuclear plant. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> I've heard many, many stories. So uh that seems to be all the questions. I'm going to do my usual thank you. So this is your last opportunity to type something into the Q&A or the chat bar while I say my thank yous to everybody and say my goodbyes. I will answer it if you have any last minute questions. Um, oh, see, as soon as I say that, a couple, some stuff comes in. It says you have a switch between two bridge resistor circuits. Can you clarify that, Jose? Are, are you asking if I have a switch? Uh, because there is no switch on the circuits that I've shown. Um, it's just two resistors. Are you saying, should we have a switch? Or you have a switch? There are some, now, now that you mention it, there are some circuits where you, you have a switch that tests the ground fault circuit and basically that switch just connects the positive to ground through a resistor and the negative to ground with for a resistor so you can test the ground fault circuits you can create basically a soft ground and see if the alarm comes on you're saying no for the 250 center tap system okay that's something out with So he's saying that there could be a switch between the two information in there that uh, you didn't know that I've taught you something through this. Um, it's always good to discuss these things, even if you know about them. It's always good to refresh your memory and see how uh, uh, things actually work. Um, as always, after this, you're going to re uh, receive a survey. And the reason why I did a DC ground fault um, webinar, I created this, was because somebody in one of the previous surveys actually said, can you do something on DC ground faults? So I do read the surveys. I really want to know what you, everybody out there, what you want me to discuss 
regarding UPSs, DC systems, and uh, battery systems. So please do fill in the survey, especially that last question that asks, I think it's actually question five, you know, what subjects would you want to be discussed in the, in the next webinar? Um, London has just put there um, in the chat bar. If you have any questions, concerns about UPSs, if you want to get in touch with us, you can go to our website, Solid State Controls, using the Contact Us uh, feature. The link is in there. You can email us at sci.marketing at amatech.com, or you can call us on our toll-free number, 1-800-635-7300. You do have to go through a menu tree, but you will always get to speak to a human. Um, I can pretty much guarantee that. I always caveat it with pretty much. Um, sometimes our phone system does go down. So, um, but there should always be a human um, when you choose service. Okay. Um, also, once again, the marketing department will um, be sending out that uh, link to everybody that registered for this uh, webinar for the YouTube link tomorrow. Um, so it'll probably go in tomorrow morning so you can review it there. And that answers your next question, Robert. Can you get the slides? Unfortunately, they are proprietary. But you do get the link to the YouTube video. So you can share that with whoever you want and you can go through the slides at your heart's content. But you cannot get the slides themselves unfortunately. So I think that is pretty much everything. I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, wherever you're located, whether it's evening, daytime. And I look forward to speaking to you at our... Oh, wait there, Eddie, can you discuss NGR for generator and transformers? NGR, uh, neutral ground resistor, um, I said earlier on in the webinar that I'm not going to cover AC ground faults. Um, so I don't have time to, to go into AC ground faults. And uh, I have to be honest, I'm not as knowledgeable about AC ground faults. I do understand high resistance ground networks and all that kind of stuff and how that interacts with the UPS. But uh, I can't talk about the, the NGR and generator and transformers at this time, Eddie. Maybe. I'll look into that and, and create a webinar going forward. So take care, everyone. Watch out for an email that tells you when the next webinar will be. It will be probably, it's usually always the third Wednesday of the month. That's what we try and keep it. Sometimes it's delayed um, with all the other stuff that's going on in our business, but uh, we do try and keep it at the third Wednesday. And uh, hopefully we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you once again and uh, take care until next time.